think we probably have uh, enough people. Um, so I would like to start uh, this meeting, um, if that's okay with everybody. First of all, I would like to welcome you all, both those who are participating through Zoom and those who are joining via Facebook Live. Welcome to this Chatham House discussion on responding to the humanitarian situation in Ethiopia's Tigray region. A very special welcome to Samar Kloko, who is the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Head of the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. And he will be our key discussant this afternoon. But I'll say a little bit more about him uh, in due course. So before we start the discussion, I would like uh, to just go through some housekeeping and guidance on how this meeting will run to ensure that we have a good discussion, that we have enough time to take as many questions as possible from as many of you in the time allotted, and also to ensure that we do so with mutual respect. So all attendees will be muted during the presentation. So don't be surprised but you'll be able to use the raise hand function during the Q&A session in order to ask a question live. If you're selected, you'll be granted by the Africa program team the ability to unmute yourself and to ask your question. Apologies in advance if you're not able to ask a question and if we run out of time uh, this time round. Please help me uh, by keeping your questions very short and concise, and that will allow us to get more people in to ask questions. The Zoom participants may also submit written questions through the Q&A box throughout the meeting. But if you can, please use the raise hand function during the allocated Q&A session so that you can ask your question directly. Uh, I would much prefer to hear it from you than just to read it. Um, also, please remember that this meeting will be on the record. I want to repeat that this meeting will be on the record. This means that those present may use information from the meeting and may identify the speaker or any other participants. Lastly, um, just so that you know, filming and recording of this event are not allowed without the prior permission from Chatham House. So unless you already have that prior permission, please do not film and do not record. However, we encourage members of the audience are very much welcome to tweet the event using the hashtag CA, CA Afri, no, CH African. Let me repeat that, hashtag CH African. And now to our discussion. Let me just uh, frame the discussion and maybe set, set the context, uh, context before I invite Samark to, to speak. An estimated 2.3 million people are in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. Over 60,000 refugees have fled from Ethiopia to Sudan since the 7th of November. Over 52,000 people are said to have been killed since the conflict started. An estimated additional 2 million people have been internally displaced in the conflict in Tigray. These are in addition to the existing internally displaced persons in the region. Please note also that it is estimated that there are hundreds of thousands of other internally displaced persons in other regions, other parts of the country, for example, in Konso. Conflict in Ethiopia's Northern Tigray region, which began in November, 2020, has brought about a security and humanitarian crisis that has seen civilian killings, mass displacement and escalating food insecurity. An emergency coordination system has been instituted by the federal government alongside humanitarian organizations to assess and deliver food, non-food items and medical supplies. However, continuing physical and food insecurity remain serious challenges. While restrictions on humanitarian access and communication networks in parts of Tigray persist with reports of ongoing military activity, questions on sexual violence and human rights violations are also of concern. And therefore at this event, to lead us in this discussion, we are really truly privileged that Samark Lokok will discuss this current humanitarian situation, including the level of need and the main challenges to providing assistance. 
hopefully he will also discuss the priorities for the international and regional partners in supporting relief efforts, civilian protection and reconstruction in coordination with national and local level actors. So what a few words about uh, Samark. Like I said earlier on, he is the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, as well as the head of OCHA, a position that he has held since 2017. He holds responsibility for oversight of all emergencies requiring UN humanitarian assistance and acts as the central focal point for governmental, intergovernmental and non-governmental relief activities. Prior to his current position, Mark was the permanent secretary of the UK Department for International Development from 2011 to 2017. I think that you agree with me and that it is fair to say this afternoon, we're in very good hands for this discussion. Mark, can I invite you to kick off the discussion by, offer, by sharing with us some of your thoughts on the subject? You have up to about 20 minutes and then hopefully we can open up uh, to the question and answer session. Over to you, Mark. Uh, well, Amanda, thank you very much indeed. Thank uh, you also to the team at Chatham House uh, for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. And thank you to everybody who um, is dialing in. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, all of you. Um, I'm, I'm talking to you today, I hope with a, you know, an appropriate degree of humility. Many of you uh, in this conversation know a lot more about um, Tigray and Ethiopia in the region than I do. Um, but it, it is a place that, and a region that I've tried to follow. I was first in Tigray actually in 1986, so 35 years ago. And um, I have, uh, my first job was, was in the wake of the, um, obviously the famine in the mid 1980s. Uh, and I spent my career, as you know, in development and humanitarian issues. I have visited Ethiopia a lot um, over the years. The last time was in um, 2018 and 2019. And I have admired hugely the amazing development story, the amazing story of progress that Ethiopia um, has been with huge reductions in um, poverty, um, the expansion of um, services to people, high rates of economic growth, uh, reductions in infant mortality, people living longer. Um, and I've seen on my visits, which have taken me all over Ethiopia, actually, the fruits of that development progress. Um, I went some years ago to the Grand Renaissance Dam when it was being built. I've been to factories where people are working. I've traveled on Ethiopia's impressive national road network. I've been on the new railway from um, Addis Ababa to um, down to the coast. I didn't go all the way actually, but I went on a stretch of it and I visited schools and hospitals and universities and I've met lots of um, Ethiopians all over the country um, on these um, visits. And it is, uh, it, it really is one of the world's most impressive stories of development progress in a very um, brief period. And that has given people not just better lives in material terms, but also um, more freedoms and liberties and all sorts of um, other benefits that come from development. I was taught at university by Amartya Sen and he, what he says is development is about the acquisition of freedoms and I agree with that and the development that Ethiopia has seen over that um, period I've talked about has brought multiple um, benefits and against all that background it is um, very tragic to me that we now face a set of uh, problems that we see, especially in northern Ethiopia, but also in one or two other places um, as well. I, it, it breaks my heart, honestly, to um, see these problems, and no one hopes more than I do that, that there can be um, progress in resolving them and dealing with the underlying issues, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, um, it's important to recognise, I think, that um, before we start to talk about what happened from um, early November and the, and the issues we now need to deal with, there um, have been a number of other issues, including issues which have um, brought um, humanitarian organizations uh, in, um, in an important way in Ethiopia in the recent period. Obviously, Ethiopia, like every other country on the planet, 
has had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. There was also a, a major locust problem in the Horn of Africa last year, where Ethiopia was again um, hit. And um, the accumulation of all these issues together with, with um, internal tensions um, has, um, you know, meant that there have been high levels of humanitarian um, need. And um, this also has wider effects. It obviously affects the uh, whole of the national economy and uh, makes it harder to sustain the development gains that I have talked about. Um, unfortunately, in Ethiopia, it looks to us as though um, the number of people living in extreme poverty because of the combination of all these things is set to rise uh, this year. And I know that there are um, wider economic problems, um, the availability of foreign exchange, the availability of remittances, managing um, Ethiopia's external debt. Um, and I hope the wider world will provide generous support to Ethiopia and to many other countries to deal with those longer run issues um, as well. Now, turning now to um, the situation that developed um, in uh, late last year, um, the pandemic led to a delay in the 2020 elections, and that, I think, reinforced long-standing tensions in the Tigray region. And the regional government, as you all know, went ahead and, and held um, elections, notwithstanding the views of the um, government in Addis Ababa. Tensions grow, conflict broke out in November between the federal government and the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, and that created a basically a security protection and humanitarian crisis in the Tigray region. And one of the underlying problems is that both the Ethiopian federal government and the TPLF view each other as illegitimately in power. And that, that is something that needs to be, um, the, needs to be addressed. Um, now, um, thousands of people are reported to have been killed in the fighting that broke out, hundreds of thousands displaced. Many people are still um, in fear of their lives. And as I told the Security Council, when I briefed them privately about what's been going on about 10 days ago, the humanitarian conditions in Tigray now are fairly described as dire. Hunger and malnutrition levels are rising. The health system's essentially collapsed. There's more than a million children out of school and hundreds of thousands of people can't access the assistance they Need. Indeed, one of the problems we have is the actual extent of humanitarian need is still unknown because humanitarian agencies have not um, hitherto had more than quite limited access to much of the Tigray uh, region over the last three months. So we have here all the ingredients of a growing humanitarian tragedy and a risk of significant further deterioration if help and indeed protection doesn't reach people in need now. And um, the people in need include Ethiopians, but they also include um, something like 100,000 Eritrean um, refugees, um, people who had moved from Eritrea um, um, to seek refuge in, um, in um, northern Ethiopia, primarily in Tigray. It's also important to know that um, and remind ourselves that Tigray was um, was suffering a range of problems um, before um, November. Something like 1.6 million of the 5.7 million inhabitants were already dependent on food assistance for their survival before November. I want to say a little bit more about the underlying humanitarian and uh, um, um, related issues now, just starting with um, food insecurity. Um, I mean, everybody knows the deadly cause and effect of conflict and hunger, I think, and that's what we're seeing now. Um, markets are devoid of food. Um, the fighting, as you know, broke out during the harvest season. Lots of crops therefore weren't harvested. Trade routes to the region remain cut off. Most of the population is rural and the banking system um, isn't working now in most rural areas. So access to cash is minimal. One thing that means is the price of what food there is, is increasing quite dramatically. And these are conditions in which um, in other places and, and previously in Ethiopia, we've seen that famine, the most extreme form of food insecurity can take hold. And the Famine Early Warning Systems Network has attested to that at the moment. Meanwhile, there are also increases in rates of severe malnutrition. Uh, and that partly reflects um, 
the locust problem last year, COVID and, and related things. Three months after the conflict broke out, many of Tigray's basic services have still not um, resumed. The health system, as I mentioned earlier, is particularly a source of concern to us. I think uh, from what we can tell, one in five health facilities in rural areas is functioning. That's the WHO's assessment. Many of the rest have been looted or damaged or have no electricity. That means that things like vaccine stocks that they held um, are no longer usable. There's a shortage of clean water and we have heard credible reports of cholera outbreaks and uh, risks are accumulating also because COVID-19 surveillance has come to a halt. So it's hard to say how the coronavirus is spreading and the impact that will have. Telecommunications, electricity, transport, banks are also disrupted. Other than in, in large towns and cities, also many civil servant salaries have gone unpaid for months. There are also, beyond all of these material issues, very deep, um, this, uh, troubling, deeply troubling and serious allegations of violations of human rights, of international humanitarian law and of international refugee law. There are multiple allegations of gender-based violence, including sexual violence, um, and many of them are widely reported to have been perpetrated by men in uniform. We've also received reports of separated children, of forced recruitment, and missing family members. And there is quite a lot of evidence, documentation, and indeed videos now circulating about all this. I myself have seen just in the last day or so, horrific new video fo footage. For example, a video um, showing more than 20 dead men on the ground, all, all people wearing civilian clothing, uh, covered in dirt and blood and um, another uh, two men in the same video still alive, but clearly afraid and in pain, lying among the dead bodies. This is um, something that's believed to have happened around Waldiba, which is um, um, an ancient church in the northwestern in, in, um, in um, Tigray. Um, and there were in this in this video, there were also soldiers in uniform who were visibly wandering around. And I want to tell everybody that um, the source of this video is is a source I regard as completely unimpeachable. I believe that what these pictures show is what they um, what they are intended to show. Uh, and there are other highly credible reports uh, demonstrating similar things as well. I mentioned Eritrean refugees earlier, tens of thousands of them have not only been caught up in the conflict, but have also, and in, 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 in many cases, have been attacked and killed. There are two refugee camps in the north that were home to Eritrean refugees, Hitsats and Shemelba, have reportedly been destroyed. And we don't know what's happened to many of the people who were seeking refuge there. And this situation is extremely critical for um, Eritrean refugees in the Afar and Amhara regions um, as well. Humanitarian workers too are facing increased threats to their protection. We've seen reports of at least six humanitarian workers being killed since the beginning of the conflict and many other serious incidents reported. One thing that will be needed is thorough impartial investigations into all of these uh, reports and an accountability system will be necessary if the reasons to move forward in due course towards peace, which we want to see. I want to say now a few things about access for humanitarian um, organizations. We've had a hard time um, in the first phase of the, these difficulties reaching people in need, particularly in the rural areas where the vast majority of the population has been living and where a lot of extra people, by the way, sought um, refuge. People, in many cases, moved from the towns and urban areas trying to get somewhere safe in the rural areas. Humanitarian organisations are ready and able to scale up and provide additional support to the region, but that requires um, access and permission to enter the region has been slow to be um, provided over the last three months. We are, though, I hope, starting to see important progress um, on that. A number of very senior UN colleagues of mine have been in Ethiopia over the last 
10 days or so, including Filippo Grandi, who's the head of um, UNHCR, the refugee organization, and David Beasley, the head of the World Food Programme. And they have had, as have I, um, in my um, further distance discussions, constructive and encouraging um, exchanges recently with the authorities um, at all levels, actually. And we, from the humanitarian perspective, we've basically highlighted three things we would like to see. Um, firstly, we've reinforced the importance of protection of civilians. Um, and I have um, talked about that already. Secondly, we've, we've asked for unimpeded, immediate, safe, wide scale access for humanitarian organizations and staff. And third, for the restoration of basic services. And I do think the Ethiopian authorities understand the potential for further deterioration if we don't um, get to a position where we can meet more of the humanitarian needs. So I am pleased that earlier this week, UN agencies received approval from the government for 25 more international staff to move to Tigray. That's a, a very positive um, step. We hope also to receive approval soon for another 60 or so NGO and UN um, staff to go to the region as well, as well as a rapid approval system um, which can be used um, into the future. And the World Food Programme have also recently been able to um, agree with the um, government of program to increase food assistance to a million people um, in Tigray, um, as well as nutrition support to 875,000 women and children. We're <coughs> obviously mobilizing funds to um, support this effort. We put out an, a Northern Ethiopia humanitarian response plan late last year, seeking $117 million for the first six months or so. And that is 65% funded now, including the $25 million from um, funds that I manage uh, myself, voluntarily contributed um, in advance um, for contingency purposes by member states. So uh, I want to thank all the donors who've contributed um, to enable us to um, scale up. Next, um, next steps. Well, let's, let's say a word about what the best way out of this crisis is. Um, firstly, as I've emphasized, we want to see access, we want to meet the needs of people um, who have, um, who, there's a huge amount of suffering. We want, to, we want to be able to get better access to meet those people's needs. I, I often though also talk about the danger in situations like this of simply dealing with symptoms and not causes. And the root causes of what's happened in Tigray are complex, obviously, but I do feel, um, and here I'm reiterating what, what the Secretary General of the United Nations has said, that there does need to be a dialogue process um, to overcome divisions and to address underlying um, issues. Many people think that need to extend beyond the Tigray region because um, there are other issues as well across Ethiopia, but there's certainly a dialogue process needed um, for um, the Tigray region. That is not the direct responsibility of humanitarian agencies, but humanitarian agencies, agencies will need to keep providing help while, while decision makers hopefully can reach political agreement. And this is not just an issue of Tigray. Um, what we don't want to see is um, security vacuums in other parts of the country. In my recent visits, um, both to the south and to Somali, to SNMPR and Somali region, one of the things I've seen is people being displaced by other clashes and conflicts. And um, what we don't want is that to happen on a, on a large scale, um, obviously. People are obviously also concerned about regional destabilization. Um, the conflict has reportedly drawn in the Eritrean military and various militia groups from outside Tigray. The contested Sudan-Ethiopian border has been increasingly militarized and armed clashes have occurred there. And <clears throat> it's also important to remember that the um, Ethiopian um, um, defense forces have played important roles over recent history, for example, in the Africa Union mission in Somalia and the Abyei border region between Sudan and South Sudan. And the redeployment of Ethiopians from those places risks creating um, security vacuums, which could create other problems. So regional stability and recent gains in it are at risk at the moment as well. 
There are a lot of actors who have influence here and the wider world has a legitimate interest, I think. Uh, the Africa Union, leaders across the Greater Horn, powerful Gulf countries um, in the region, members of the Security Council, the European Union, the US, others, I hope all will do what they can to help end the current conflict and the suffering. I do think it's extremely important that leaders with influence wield it in a responsible way um, and use their influence to support dialogue and help ensure humanitarian assistance gets to people who need it. Um, avoiding doing anything, taking any actions or saying anything that would further inflame um, tensions. Um, I also want to say I'm encouraged by um, the interest the new US administration are already um, playing on this um, issue. And I, I, I think their engagement has the potential to be um, important and constructive and valuable. So finally, a deterioration is avoidable. Ethiopia has long been a beacon of hope and progress and stability. There's a lot of progress to be built on, but there's also a lot of risk. Humanitarian organizations will be ready always to help people who need help, but we need access and there needs to be a dialogue process to resolve the underlying issues. Amanda, thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, Mark. I think that you have really given us um, uh, both, I think, uh, a full context, but also quite some, um, I think personally, I would say some disturbing um, uh, uh, statistics, um, but uh, some hope as well. So there are quite a lot of questions that have already started, and I'll soon be asking people to put their hands, to raise their hands. So if you can just go into the raise your hand function and raise your hand so that I could invite you to ask your questions. And while people are preparing to do that, I just wanted to follow up on um, a couple of things that you said. When you talked about um, access and uh, the, the three uh, key things that uh, you've, been, uh, you've been negotiating, so that permission has been very slow, um, protection of civilians in terms of unimpeded um, access and restoration of basic services. Uh, could you say a little bit more about where that really is and is it and is it enough? And um, I think when you were when you were presenting, you also referred to the fact that you know there's now been we've been allowed an additional 25 um, um, members of staff. And uh, but that seems very, very little. In fact, perhaps too little uh, in the when you think of the backdrop of such a such a massive um, crisis, actually. Um, so I was just wondering, did you want to say a little bit more about that? And then I'll start inviting people to come in with their questions. Um, yes, thank you. Um, well. Um, I mean, I, I tried to say that I, I basically agree with your underlying point there, that access has been slow. We hope it's improving, but it's not yet where we think it um, needs to be. And it's, it's um, a confidence building measure, really, uh, to see further progress, particularly for those 60 international staff of NGOs and the UN who are basically waiting to go and join colleagues and teams um, in uh, delivering assistance and assessing needs together with the local authorities and the government and others um, in um, Integrate. We have um, had since the 4th of January, uh, Deputy Humanitarian Coordinator, a very senior um, UN colleague who has been based in McKelly since the 4th of January. She's, she's in fact one of um, the senior staff uh, in, in my office, the, our director for East Africa, we redeployed her um, to provide some coordination leadership in northern Ethiopia. And we're very keen for her to be able to travel around to a wider variety of other places um, in northern Ethiopia um, as soon as possible. People are one thing, but supplies um, are also necessary. And um, Again, as I say, we hope that there'll be rapid implementation of the agreement that the World Food Programme 
uh, David Beasley reached with um, the Ethiopian authorities the other day. But, but the same requirement for supplies and assistance and um, you know, things that provide practical help to people arises for NGOs, for um, the organizations focusing, for example, on health issues like WHO and UNICEF, to deal with disease outbreaks, to see what we can do to get children back in school. Um, for those people who've been displaced again, there's issues of shelter, there's issues of clean water. You know, the needs are large and diverse. And, um, you know, so, so multiple capabilities are needed to address them. I, I want to just make the point, which I haven't made before, that the new provisional local authorities in McKelly mm -hmm. um, have said to us they are extremely keen uh, for a larger scale, faster assistance to um, get through as well. So we hope that, um, as I say, we hope that we'll see faster progress on all this sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, shall we, um, will it work for you, Mark, if I take three, if, can you take three questions at one go? Great. So can I ask um, Nuhu? Noha, Shika, Sheik, sorry. Am I pronouncing that right? Could you please ask your question live? Uh, can I ask the team to unmute, please? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amanda, and thank you, Mark. My name is uh, Noha Sheik. I work for IGAD, the regional uh, body. Uh, what role do you see, uh, or would you like to see IGAD play uh, in this, and how can the UN partner with uh, IGAD. And uh, secondly, what contingency plan uh, have the UN uh, put in place uh, in the unlikely event that uh, there will be no political solution to the Sudan-Ethiopia uh, border dispute? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I invite uh, Sarah, Sarah Vaughan, if you can ask your question, please. Sarah, yeah. Hello, thank you. Um, Mark, you were quoted as saying on the 4th of February that Abbey's government controls between 60 and 80% of the territory in Tigray. Uh, the head of the Ethiopian Red Cross was quoted this afternoon as saying that 80% of the territory of Tigray is inaccessible and cut off from humanitarian assistance. Is one of you wrong or do we have to conclude that the government is actively blocking aid to Tigray? Mm -hmm. And then I'll take a third one. Can I take, uh, is it Yasmin, Yasmin McDonald? Hi, thank you. Am I, can you hear me? Yes, you are on yeah. live. Please Great. ask your thank question. You. Um, Yasmin McDonald from Christian Aid. Um, what role does Sir Mark believe faith leaders could most usefully play in helping to address the challenges we face in Tigray? Thank you. All right, I think let's take those ones and then I'll come back uh, to the next three. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Nur Sheikh, for your um, question. I think EGAD has played a very important role on multiple issues, particularly in terms of dialogue and um, peace building efforts um, over, um, particularly over recent decades, actually, um, in the region. And I'm sure I'm sure there's an important role to play now alongside the AU and others with a um, with an interest, particularly in you know they're, they're, as always with these things, there needs to be a, the right combination of private and public dialogue. And a lot of the things, a lot of things I hope will be advanced um, firstly through private dialogue and then um, um, built on in a more public and visible um, way. I um, I was talking to. Uh, colleagues last week who have responsibilities across the um, more in the political and peacekeeping parts of the UN and there is a lot of concern about recent developments um, in in the border area between um, Sudan and Ethiopia obviously the heads of government have been in dialogue about that um, there are um, I mean it's very very important that um, nobody um, uses the current circumstances to um, inflame, tent, to inflame tensions or poke a stick at problems that really need to be brought under control, not exacerbated. And um, we are 
um, watching very carefully what everybody's doing in the current circumstances and trying to um, reinforce the need to, for things to be calmed down, not, um, not amplified. Um, <laughs> Sarah, I, I'm, I'm off, I find I'm often quoted and sometimes it's accurate and sometimes it's um, not accurate or it's incomplete. Um, so um, what I would say um, uh, in, in response to your question is, um, obviously there is a difference between, at the moment what we've had is a difference between areas where the government is in control or says it's in control on the one hand and places to which humanitarian organizations can get to on the other hand. Those, those are conceptually different things and, and obviously we would like to get everywhere where the government says it, it has um, control with humanitarian assistance and protection because it's obvious to us and to everybody I think that there's lots of unmet needs there. We would also though like to reach um, populations, civilian populations in parts of northern Ethiopia which um, um, the government who I think have put out their own numbers on how what proportions of the um, you know what proportion of the total territory they're currently they currently feel in control of and it's not 100% from what they've said we would like to get to people in those places the government are not saying they're in control um, as well um, and that is what we will um, go on trying to do with with others as I mentioned earlier there are um, there are reports of incredible reports, corroborated reports, including with corroboration from um, Ethiopian official sources themselves of Eritrean troops and of Amhara militia. Um, and, um, you know, we would like access to everywhere where there are civilians who need, um, need help. Yes, I mean, I think faith leaders, as always, have potentially a very um, substantial role to play and I've spoken myself to some very senior faith leaders. There's a lot of interest uh, and concern about uh, northern Ethiopia um, and um, I don't know Amanda might want as a, as a leader of a humanitarian faith organization, faith-based organization herself, Christian Aid, might want to say something about what Christian Aid is um, and, and other organizations you work with and your local partners um, are doing as well Amanda. I don't want to put uh, words in the mouths of other organizations. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. I will um, I will come in right at the end so that I um, let me give priority to those who are asking questions for now. But thank you very much. Um, uh, there are a couple of things that I wanted to follow up on, but let me bring in um, Wintana, Wintana Sky. Um, you have your hand up. Hi, thank you. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm um, tuning in from Germany, but I am of Tigrayan descent. And I'm just, um, you have to forgive me, obviously, this is a very emotional issue, but I'm beyond bewildered as to how we can continue to talk about the colossal tragedy that's unfolding in Tigray in such diplomatic tones, honestly. I mean, this is a genocide and war crimes are being committed indiscriminately uh, on a daily basis. I mean, the number one issue is obviously the invading Eritrean troops who must be removed immediately before anything else positive can happen in Tigray, honestly. There's no reason why the Ethiopian government um, is red taping humanitarian agencies. It's easier for tourists to travel within Ethiopia for their own leisure than it is for people trying to save lives. This is unacceptable. Why is the UN Security Council not acting? How about airdropping food and medicine, Sir Mark? Is that not an option? Um, I mean, thank you. this is urgent. Thank you very much, thank Mintana. Um, I think that um, the, 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 the emotion that you bring to this question, I suspect <coughs> is reflected in quite a number of people who would probably like to ask the questions. And so, um, I really welcome the fact that, you know, you've asked that particular question. Do you want to take that question on its own or do you want to take a couple more? Yes. Okay, so can I also uh, bring in uh, Dr. Ivana? I, actually, I was, gonna, I was gonna say yes, perhaps it would be a good idea for me to respond to that as you suggest. Okay. Well, I, thank you for the suggestion and thank you very much indeed um, for the question and um, as I, mentioned at the beginning, I have many Tigrayan friends around the world and 
um, I have many other Ethiopian friends as well. And um, I recognize very much and empathize very much with um, the sentiment you bring to your question. Um, I, um, you, as you know, the UN has a special advisor on genocide matters, um, Alice and Dorito. And um, I, she and I talk about these issues. In fact, we've been in touch um, again today about them. And, um, you know, allegations of mass atrocities absolutely need to be investigated. And then there needs to be account accountability um, if they, um, you know, if that's what, um, you, you know, depending on what you find through the, through the allegations, these things can't simply be um, left there um, unobserved and unattended to. That's an extremely important um, element of what needs to happen. The Security Council obviously is a forum of the member states um, of the um, United Nations and the decisions that are taken are taken by the member states in the Security Council, the 15 of them, five of them, as you know, have a uh, veto over any decision. Um, and um, the, the, what we've been able to do so far at their request, because they decide what they do and what they don't do, is provide a series of um, private briefings uh, to them on the situation. And uh, as they know, we, we, we're at their disposal to, um, in terms of all the secretariat departments and the agencies, funds and programs to do, um, you know, other things um, as and when they decide. Um, any, uh, on the question of airdrops, um, of course, that is something which has happened at some points in the past in Ethiopia. I remember in the mid 1980s, that's one of the things that we had to resort to. As a practical matter in the current circumstances, um, it should be possible with, with um, the right permissions to reach everybody by road. Um, anybody who um, wants to prevent access of humanitarian organizations by road is probably in a position to prevent access by airdrops as well. Um, so, um, what you know, one of the frustrating things about having to work on humanitarian issues is humanitarian organizations are only ever able to do things which the people in control of places will let them do. So, access always has to be negotiated, um, and that's what we're trying to do um, in the current circumstances. It helps, I think, to shine a light on what's happening on a place. That's one of the things we're trying to contribute to. But, but ultimately, consent from men with guns and bombs is what is required to reach people in need. So I guess maybe a, a, a quick sort of, um, not pushback as such, but follow-up question is, uh, uh, you know, what, what should we be doing as civil society organizations, as faith actors, um, as other humanitarian uh, actors to influence a speedy um, response that speaks really to, the, to this deteriorating situation? Um, because it, sh it surely cannot just be, I mean, we can't be, um, it feels a bit like the red tape is getting too much in the way, if that is uh, what is getting in the way. So, you know, what else, or is there something else that uh, you can give us so that we can understand fully, uh, more in detail, what is the politics behind this that is stopping people from getting to those who I need? We're now talking about millions of people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a good question for you to pose to, um, you know, other people, um, um, including the various authorities, um, you know, who have an interest in, in different countries in the region, um, in Ethiopia, um, in Mekelle and so on. The um, civil society organizations as a practical matter have a lot of um, voice and influence over what governments say and do and decide to, decide to do. Um, the governments in the Security Council all have to take account of um, what, um, you know, lobbying and influence and um, opinions and knowledge is brought to their attention by civil society organizations. So I, and civil society organizations in Ethiopia over a long period have played a very, very important role. Thank Sometimes you. their space has been more open and it's been easier to do that than others, but civil society organizations have always been important and I think they're just as important now. Okay, thanks. 
I'll have to speed up a little bit. Apologies, everyone. Um, um, Dr. Ivana, um, do you want to ask your question quickly, followed by Mibin? Mibin Maman, if you can be ready to ask your question, please. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I am just basing my insight uh, on experience in Liban. I do think that there are actually three levels uh, which can be done immediately. First important is that it's a local organization which is taking a leadership uh, along with the regional actors. Um, first, to ensure shelter and food, sanitary help, and to ensure the logistic because uh, the fundings and the help is coming from everywhere and uh, there is an urgent need to coordinate uh, help, first help to people, and uh, to ensure that there is a clear traceability of everything, funding, medical material, and coordination for care for the patient, for placement of the people. And the Thank meantime, you. in parallel, a very urgent uh, stabilization of conflict, uh, because um, there are several risks which could be a consequence is not just the displacement of the people but the outbreaks and uh, even escalation of the conflicts because of the uh, very stressful situation so i saw it so the traceability and first help and the second i do think that the leadership role is really between the region and the countries who are surrounding because they have to sit around the table and they have to establish the government, stop the conflict, sit around Sorry, the table. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Sorry for cutting in there. I just need to make sure that there are a few others that would like to come in. Mebin, or is it Mebin? You had a question. Do you want to come in at this point, please? If you are not available, I will move on to um, Mulugeta, please. Yes, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Please, can you keep your uh, question short? Yes, sure. Um, I, I am a public health professional interested actually in the classification of war as a public health issue and topics, and I'm working towards that. So my question, specific question as a person uh, who comes from that region is, one, what is your assessment of the role of the Eritrean troops in the looting and destruction of infrastructure and violations of humanitarian laws? Two, why is the response from the international community not going beyond calls to the Ethiopian government, given that reports of mass killings, which is clear violation of international law, in the pictures of bare-bone kids, which is an indication of a looming famine, which will have long-term impact to the people, to the region, and all of us, even the humanitarian agencies. Thank you. And how Thank do we you help as a diaspora community? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. Johannes, Johannes Teki, please ask your question. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please keep okay, it My short. question is regarding those two refugee camps which uh, have been destroyed recently. The Ethiopian government has announced yesterday that they are closing them down. And I wanted to ask Sir Mark, what's your intake on that uh, statement from the Ethiopian government? And what happened to those 20,000 Eritreans who have been sheltered in, that, in those camps? Thank you. I'll take one more, Mark, and then hopefully uh, we can uh, have another three. Uh, can I go to Nega, Negas, Negas Tem, Temazgin? Negas, can you ask your question? I hope I'm pronouncing your name at least so that you can know that it's you. Are you there? No. I can see your name, I can see your hand up. Can I just ask the team, have you unmuted him? Okay, Mark, I think it's best you just take those questions. Um, let's, let's go ahead, we'll come back. We're running out of time, so um, if, if you keep your responses short as well, if you don't mind, so that we can get you at least one or two more. 
I'll do my best. Thank you. So I, I mean, I, I know Dr. Ivana's comments. I think those are all relevant comments, and I've tried to address some of those issues earlier. Uh, I, on the, the second question relates to, I think, the role of Eritrean troops and violations. I mean, there are very widespread allegations um, about, about Eritrean troops' presence and what they've done. Evidence is accumulating, um, and um, I, you know, it's, it's many the things that are, things that we're hearing are very disturbing. So we're, I am very concerned about that, and um, one of the reasons um, access is important is so everyone can see what's happening, and protection and assistance can be provided to um, innocent people. On the refugee camps, yes, um, two. Uh, seem to seem to be decision to close two of the camps, which, so far as we could ascertain, uh, were camps which were no longer occupied and upon which there had been significant um, destruction and damage. The question of what happened to the people who were there is a very, very important question, and we're we're very concerned to know the answer to that. Um, we think that some people were dispersed to other parts of northern Ethiopia. But there are also um, alarming reports of forced returns uh, to Eritrea, which would be a violation of refugee law, um, the, a violation of the non refoulement um, principle. Um, and um, there have also been reports of killings and abductions. And again, access um, is important to be able to uh, establish the facts and provide assistance to people and, and uh, to shine a light on people who are not complying with, with international legal obligations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we just uh, fit in another three very, very quickly? Can I start with Kia? Kia, please, can you just ask your question quite quickly? Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, dear uh, Sir Mark, thank you very much for the presentation, but I see uh, that you are neglecting the major points for the start of the start of the war, and why don't you be appreciative of what the Ethiopian government, the federal government, have been doing in providing medical supplies, food items? You know, so the Ethiopian government has made this uh, law enforcement operation to save uh, the the country and the state from the state integration. So, can you ever imagine if? This the TPLF clique was successful in dismantling the Ethiopian defense forces. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I have Gabriel? Gabriel, got to. Can you please come in if you have if you're there? Yeah. Uh, are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Please yeah, thank keep you. your question short. Yes. Thank you, Mark. My, my concern is, you you lament the fact that there has not been full access. Uh, throughout the region, and I, I suspect there is limited access, but the way you're presenting this continues to undermine the heroic work of local NGOs and community groups. You make it sound like, unless there is some European NGO spoon feeding a starving child, then humanitarian access has not been provided, and that is not true. There has been ongoing support by locals, by the government, by the regional government. And I think we need to take cognizance of that and not pretend like the UN is the only body that comes with food and, and, and the whole of Tigray depends on that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to take one last hand, but I, I would like to take a, a female hand if it's okay. Um, so, but since the names do not tell me the gender, I will just, what about Saba? No? Hello? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm from Canada. Uh, I just wanna respond. Can I respond or can I only ask? You can respond, but can you just keep it really brief? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna really gonna make it brief because yeah. uh, as my friends already asked uh, Mr. Mark about the Eritrean troop, uh, troops removal from Tigray, uh, as he explained it, I will take it that uh, in that way. But my two brothers, the Ethiopian government never have been allowed uh, aids from UN to Tigray 
how how come the Ethiopian government is reaching all in the mountains while the war is ongoing? Why do you deny? The Ethiopian government officially blocked everything from the United Nations. Okay. We are begging the United Nations because they are the only powerful fact actors to reach with humanitarian aids. Why? Okay. Mark, would you like to take those questions? I think she's dropped out. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, the, the first question in that set was about um, you know, the origins of the problem, this, um, to put it mildly, disagreement between the TPLF and, and the previous Tigrayan government and the government of Ethiopia, and I touched on that. Um, the, um, the, the, the government of Ethiopia has played a role in trying to get uh, some food and other supplies into limited parts of um, Ethiopia, but they um, themselves have been saying to us that um, there is a need for more. Um, and, um, you know, I think everybody has an interest in meeting the um, basic human needs and reinforcing the basic human rights of everybody who's in Tigray. And uh, it shouldn't be contentious to say that, and it shouldn't be controversial for the wider world to express its legitimate interest in um, ensuring that to happen, because um, the authorities all say they want that to happen as well. There then does need to be a dialogue process to find a way forward to address the underlying uh, issues, as I've, um, as I've said. Thank you very much indeed to the colleague who raised the crucial role of local organizations. I completely agree with, with um, everything you said there. Most of the people who work for the UN, by the way, um, in Northern Ethiopia, as in most places, are, are Ethiopians, including Ethiopians from many different heritages and backgrounds and parts of the um, country. And most of what the UN does um, in Northern Ethiopia, as in so many other places, is through and in coordination and in support of local organizations. And um, so thank you very much indeed for reinforcing that point. I completely agree with you. Um, you. Completely agree with you on it. Um, the, um, and I think I've sort of, I tried to deal earlier in the conversation, Amanda, with the other, uh, with the other point. Yeah. So let me read you these last two comments. Um, you appreciate there were over 50 questions and we've just scratched the surface. And I suspect that we probably you know, could have done more, um, but uh, for the time that, uh, that we have. So two questions that I think capture quite a number of uh, uh, people's thoughts. One is uh, from Helenia and it's, she says, my question is regarding gender responsive humanitarian response. How well prepared would you say you as the UN is to address the specific needs of women and girls during such a crisis, specifically speaking to the issue of rape and sexual abuse allegations, we have repeatedly heard coming out of the Tigray region. I think you mentioned them yourself, uh, Mark. The second comment um, is um, from Peyton. The Ethiopian Red Cross itself is reporting this morning that 80% of Tigray is cut off from aid while appreciating the tentative progress of 25 humanitarians being granted access and perhaps 60 more on the horizon, doesn't the scope and scale of the emergency demand a major overhaul of the framework for access that includes not just ENDF, but non-ENDF controlled areas? And those two questions I suspect cover and capture quite a lot of sentiments. Um, is the response uh, the right level of response? Um, well, um, firstly, thank you very much indeed to everybody who sent um, questions and comments on. I have colleagues who are on the call and we're digesting everything that's being said in the chat. Um, we're available to answer more detailed questions from any of you. Um, if you leave your um, contact, if you'd like a, a specific response, you, you leave your contact details in the chat. I'm going to ask my colleagues to try and pick them up with the help of Chatham House so that we can follow up the, uh, the conversation with you. Uh, on on your, those last two points, Amanda, firstly, um, and there are huge concerns about the position of um, women and girls uh, facing multiple risks. And um, 
it would appear um, multiple atrocities um, as tragically happens all too regularly um, in, um, in conflict situations. And, and there's, there's basically four sorts of things that we need to mobilize to and, and to address to help um, those women and girls. The firstly, firstly is just um, their physical health needs um, after an attack. Um, which are often very significant and trained staff need to be available to provide um, medical care and assistance to people. Secondly, there are psychosocial um, support needs and um, assistance that unfortunately women and girls often need after those kind of experiences, which historically has been neglected by humanitarian organizations. We're trying to do better on um, in the current circumstances. Thirdly, People need assistance to um, recover and rebuild their lives and, um, you know, re-establish re themselves. Often these kind of um, crimes and atrocities um, attract stigma, tragically, from um, other um, people in the community. And so people often need help rebuilding their lives and, and trying to um, get back to some kind of, um, you know, new normal, better normal. And then, then the fourth thing, which is crucial, is justice there needs to be accountability these are crimes that are being described and um, people need to pay a price when they commit these kinds of crimes on the um, on the the observation or the report from the Ethiopian Red Cross that 80 um, percent they say of um, the region is still not accessible to humanitarian organizations it sort of makes the point <laughs> I've been trying to make during the course of the conversation that access remains a huge problem we've seen some um, beginnings of that being addressed but there's a lot more that's needed to be done and the situation to repeat what I said earlier is deteriorating things are getting worse and there will be much larger scale loss of life unless uh, we turn things around um, very urgently that's one of the reasons I was keen to have this discussion today the situation is urgent and it's dire and it needs to be turned around in everybody's interests um, sooner rather than later Thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you very much, uh, Mark, for, for, for coming and having this discussion. I, I want to say thank you to Chatham House for creating this space. I think that uh, my suggestion would be that you probably need a part two to this conversation, um, uh, hopefully a conversation that takes us into a hope and into solutions. Um, you recently announced, Mark, that you will be stepping down. Um, and um, so what last piece of advice would you give to your replacement as they come in uh, into this kind of situation? You're on mute. You're muted. Ah. Yeah, sorry, I was struggling with, struggling with the mute button there. Um, well, yes, you're right. I, I, um, I'm the 13th person to do this job since it was created in 1991. I think by the time I finish I will be the second longest serving and um, I'm moving on essentially because I I spent a lot of time away from my family over um, the last you know while I've been doing this job and I I want to spend more time with them into the future so now is a is, is the right time for me to move on I'll be staying until the Secretary General's decided who he wants to um, take over from me um, I will be available to help whoever that is in whatever way they want and including on Ethiopia, which I've had a long um, and mostly very happy association with, and I would like to see move forward in a positive way into the, um, into the future. Um, humanitarian agencies play a hugely important role in the world in crises like this, and uh, the coordination support service that my office has provided over the last 30 years since, since, it was, um, since my post was created and the office was established is important, and that will go on into the future as I pass the baton on to uh, somebody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think I can even begin to summarize that. My personal takeaway from this conversation is that um, action is needed and it's needed now. Um, I think that the point on uh, humanitarian corridors and access has been uh, made by quite a lot of people um, that is, uh, is needed. I think that um, there is a question on, uh, I guess, why the government is um, not opening up much more and much faster. Um, I think there was also something else that I'm taking away, which is that, you know, we have to look at this as a holistic problem. So, yes, we are focused on Tigray, but actually there are 
hundreds of thousands of internally displaced persons around Ethiopia. And, uh, and so when we think of the future in terms of peace building, I think we need to look at the whole country. I think the last thing that, uh, last two things, one is um, that there are other countries that are involved uh, on the neighbors. Eritrea uh, is another one, uh, is one, and Sudan, and uh, also uh, perhaps um, others that need to be brought into the conversation. And then the last thing I think that's really heartbreaking is that this is all happening in the middle of a pandemic. The health um, uh, of, of the people, especially women and girls who are then being um, uh, violated. I think that um, we can't have another Rwanda where the world stands by and watches and waits until the situation is really dire. I think um, we need to push and, and push a little bit more. And I'm hoping that the government uh, is also willing to do so. So thank you very much. I think that's everything for me. And um, thank you everyone for participating. As you heard, Mark and his team will respond to your questions. Those of you who leave your details and um, thank you to Chatham House.